Welcome to another Saturday morning physics presentation. I'm physics professor Tim Chupp, your SMP co-host with Professor Roy Clark here. And it's great to see everyone, though the lights are shining rather brightly in my eyes. Um, so it is hard to see. Uh, we're pleased to have you here at Saturday morning physics and in, um, also to welcome all of the fans who are online. This live broadcast of our events and was an outcome of the COVID adjustments that we made. And we're really happy to be able to uh, bring this to audiences online, live, these lectures. And I want to say that this is in part because of support for Saturday Morning Physics from the Physics Department and from you, our loyal fans and patrons of SMP. So we thank you for your continuing contributions. Professor Roy Clark and I actually um, want to highlight a few people who make this possible. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge uh, Carol Raybuck, whom we all see greeting us at the very beginning. And I also want to thank Monica Wood and her staff from the Warren Smith Demo Lab. They take care of all things technical and the demos that we so enjoy for many of our lectures. Now, turning to today's lecture by Dr. Mark Reynolds here uh, from our astronomy department, um, we will have uh, opportunities for questions and answers afterwards. And if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please email to this address, physics at umich.edu, or uh, you can write it on a card which we will collect at the end of the lecture. Dr. Mark Reynolds, our speaker today, is from Tipperary, Ireland. That's a long way from here. Uh, as uh, he did both his undergraduate and his graduate study at the University College Cork, and he received his PhD in 2008, after which he came directly to the University of Michigan to join the astronomy department, first as a postdoc, and now he is a research scientist. His research passion and his focus has been black holes, and he is part of an international team that in fact produced the first ever image of a black hole, which we, he will tell us about today. His lecture is entitled, The Heart of Darkness. Dr. Reynolds, thanks so much for joining us, and we're looking forward to your lecture. All right, thank you uh, so much, Tim. Uh, you're very kind. Uh, and thanks to Roy and, and the staff here for helping out. It's a great pleasure to speak here at Saturday Morning Physics. One of our passions as astronomers is to bring our research to the community. and. Uh, it's because of the excitement of so much of it. Uh, we don't just get great joy from the core science discovery. It's often seeing how the public digest it. Um, with our images of M87 and Sagittarius A star, these were broadly used by the public. And um, so an artful dodger uh, added Homer to the image of M87. And that's partially because the resolution required to do this science is such that you can resolve something like a donut on the moon, um, which readily applies and brings Homer to mind. So um, today, I'll try and, and take you on the journey that uh, humanity and us in the sciences have been on um, as we've moved from conceiving uh, the idea of black holes, determining that they are actually real objects in the universe, and then studying them in detail and taking the first images with the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and I'll end then with presenting sort of where, what's the next steps that we're going to take to advance these studies further. Um, so I'll start talking about black holes. We can see um, the graphic here is one of a large suite of new simulations that are being produced now, partially motivated by the work of the EHT. 
Here you're seeing a black hole in the foreground. It's actually a binary system. There is another black hole behind it. And the gravitational field of the black hole in the foreground is lensing the black hole behind it. And that's what you're seeing in the top, that arc. So how do we get to black holes? We uh, start with general relativity. Um, and that is our description of gravity. Um, this, is, this is the only equation I'll have. And you don't really need to care about any of the terms up here. Right? There's familiar ones like g, the gravitational constant, and c, the speed of light. Everything else, there are a coupled complex set of equations. Right? People spend their lives trying to understand what's in here. What we care about is the qualitative understanding that you have geometry on the left-hand side and matter and energy on the right-hand side. And so, as John Wheeler put it, uh, the curved space-time is telling the mass and energy how to behave, or the mass and energy in the space-time is telling the space-time how to curve. And, and this was the, the step we needed um, as we started considering um, a number of problems. One of the most vexing was the orbit of Mercury. And this had frustrated people for a long time in that it precesses uh, or as it orbits the sun. Uh, it was not easy to understand. And so when Einstein produced his new theory of gravity, the value of it immediately was demonstrated because he was able to calculate the orbital precession of Mercury due to its position close to the gravitational mass of the sun. The gravitational mass of the sun curves the space-time, forcing the orbit of Mercury to precess. So that was an immediate success, which gave credibility to the theory. And it was really demonstrated then a number of years later when Eddington um, did observations of stars near the sun during an eclipse. So typically, these stars that are very near the sun, you can't see them. And so when there's an eclipse, it allows you to see these stars near the sun. Now, Gra GR predicts that the space-time is curved by the mass of the sun. The light must follow the curved path of space-time. So therefore, if there's a star behind the sun that we can't normally see, because the space-time is curved, that light ray that would go over that way will curve back towards us. And that makes us think the star is over there. And so you can carry out that test and measure the deflection of the star because we knew the mass of the sun. And hey presto, again, GR predicted that um, accurately. So we now had uh, a new theory of gravity. And immediately, people started working with this. Uh, one of the you know, foundational pieces of work was done by Carl Schwarzschild. But what I want to emphasize is that the human mind didn't need GR to start thinking about these types of topics. And so the conceptual idea of what happens if gravity is so, po so, so powerful due to there being so much mass that light can't even escape. And this was a question that John Mitchell considered back in the 1700s um, and Lapla Laplace a little bit later. Now, the numbers they got were incorrect because they didn't know the speed of light accurately. Right? But the idea was right. And they came to this idea of this object called a dark star. Now, after GR, Carl Schwarzschild uh, produced a solution to those equations. And this solution led to the consequence of this weird object. And it was weird because of two things. It had two singularities, right? one at the center, and one at this radius that we now call the, event, or the Schwarzschild radius or the event horizon. Now, it turns out that that singularity was due to the specific coordinate system that Schwarzschild chose. Um, but singularities are, in some sense, offensive. Right? It's, if your theory is producing a singularity, the immediate uh, reaction is that, OK, the theory is not is breaking down here, or there's a piece of missing information that is causing the theory to produce this result. And so for quite some time afterwards, um, 
these objects, which Schwarzschild said were essentially frozen stars, were not thought to be um, of great real world interest. Um, now, that wasn't a consensus view. There were people who thought they were real. They were a prediction of GR. But even as late as 1939, for example, Einstein wrote a paper arguing that these objects were not real, that they were not physically plausible. So what changed then? How did we move from sort of the initial playing around with the mathematics to having these real objects? And that all changed with uh, observations that were beginning in the late 50s and early 60s. And the discovery of radio galaxies, and so these are galaxies that are emitting these masses of radio plasma, and then the discovery of quasars in the 1960s. So what is a quasar? Right? A quasar means quasi-star. So when we first detected them, they essentially just looked like a point source, another star in the sky. People then got spectroscopy of it, and what they discovered was these objects are vastly distant. So to be as bright as they were required an incredible amount of energy. And it wasn't at all clear what was happening. A lot of people were arguing that the interpretation of the spectra, saying that these objects are very distant, is wrong. Because you can't produce that amount of energy with things like stars and known objects. And so it took a number of years for people to figure it out. But in sort of 64, you had Salpeter and Zeldovich both came upon the idea simultaneously that uh, if you put a black hole here, these objects that Schwarzschild had identified, uh, they would naturally, due, due to the incredibly steep and deep potential well, produce the energy that we were seeing. And so in, in, over the next decade, and say with Lyndon Bell, and by the end of that decade, it was widely now accepted that these objects, these really strange things, were apparently real, and we were seeing them in the universe. Um, now, simultaneously, uh, Roger Penrose did a very important thing. So what he demonstrated was that a logical and self-consistent and inevitable consequence of general relativity is the generation of a black hole. And this was a self-consistent analysis and showed that theoretically these objects were not offensive, they were real parts of GR. So now we had a theoretical foundation and we were having observations that were saying that these things were real. And so the term black hole then didn't actually emerge until John Wheeler came up with the idea uh, in 67, right? So before that, various different uh, terms were used. So it's only, you know, 50 odd years that we have the term. And, um, you know, of course I'm a sci-fi fan and so sci-fi rejoiced. This is interstellar sort of the place that, I guess, before the recent gravitational wave discoveries and the Event Horizon Telescope observations had placed this black hole phenomenology really beautifully in front of a global audience. And so you're seeing here some of the simulations they had in that movie um, with their spaceship and the really poorly chosen planet. Right, so what are black holes then? So, it turns out that black holes are incredibly simple objects. And what do I mean by simple? I mean, they can be described fully and completely if you know two things. You know their mass, and you know their spin, so their angular momenta. If you know both of those things, you can describe every facet of that black hole. Now, the radius of the black hole, um, these are incredibly compact regions. If we think of, for example, a one solar mass neutron star, that's the most compact form of regular baryonic matter. That would have a radius of about 10 kilometers. A one solar mass black hole will have a radius of about 1.5 to 3 kilometers. Here, right, to swallow an arbor, you'd take about three times the mass of the sun, turn that into a black hole, and Ann Arbor would be inside the event horizon of that black hole. Now, one of the things I haven't really mentioned yet is um, about these black holes that we're thinking about so far are static objects. 
Um, and when they rotate, important differences emerge. One of the first things we want to think about, though, is, well, what would these black holes look like? Now, remember, the black hole does not emit radiation. So you cannot see the black hole itself. Now, whatever you can do is the black hole will gravitationally distort things that are behind it and change the radiation in a pattern. And so you can do that calculation. And um, here's an example from Luminate back in the late 70s. Uh, and you arrive, arrive at this number, sort of square root of 27 gm over c squared. Right, so the Schwarzschild radius is two times gm over c squared. So you're looking at about two and a half times the Schwarzschild radius, or about five times this g over gm over c squared number. So this is this characteristic radius that photons that go near the black hole actually can go around the black hole and come back to you. These photons are trapped in the curved space-time and forced to follow these trajectories. And they generate this so-called photon ring of this characteristic radius. Now, this is what we would expect to see for a Schwarzschild black hole. If instead we start making these black holes rotate, um, important differences emerge. And this was work done by Kerr in, in 63, who provided a more general solution to the equations of general relativity. Um, the, this is the space-time geometry that we now accept as the paradigm and that we test when we observe things like black holes and gravitational wave events. So these are calculations here by Bardeen and Cunningham uh, in the 70s. And what you're looking at on the left here is this photon ring for a rapidly rotating black hole. So if this was a Schwarzschild black hole, this ring would be a circle, and it would be centered at 0, 0. If this black hole is rapidly rotating, right, this ring is squashed a little, and it's shifted. Now, the plots on the right are showing instead on the top we're thinking about an accretion disk around a black hole, and we're at about 20 times the radius of the black hole away from the black hole. The black hole is event horizon is donated by the little dashed circle. So the solid line is how that disk would look. And again, you're seeing the warping of space-time here. So think of, say, the rings of Saturn. Anytime you see an image of Saturn with the rings, you only see the front side of the rings. The backside is behind Saturn. Now, with a black hole, because the space-time is curved, the light being emitted by the back of the disk, actually, some of that will come out to you, out the front. And so we see the back half of the disk raised up above. Now, the inset here in the dashed line, that is now what the photon ring looks like. So this particular simulation, or calculation, is at an inclination of about 5 degrees. So we think of this as 90, this is at about 84. So it's just a little bit tilted. And below it then is something where we go much, much closer to the black hole. And you get something with a ring and a really small smudge of disk emission nearby. Now this is um, relevant because this is essentially the kind of thing that we are studying today with our Event Horizon Telescope observations. So this was the first calculation then of a detailed ray tracing where you originate photons near the black hole, release them from this disk, and do a calculation of what it would look like. And so you're seeing this disk, um, you're seeing the back of the disk, you're seeing the photon um, ring, and most importantly then you're seeing this black region. Right? This is the shadow, and this is the part of space where the light is not being emitted from. Now, this shadow is not the event horizon. The event horizon of the black hole is inside here. The shadow is produced by lensing of space time and the gravitational curvature of space time. OK, so we sort of have started with a theoretical idea. And we've put that theoretical idea on a firm footing. And now we started to do calculations of what these things would look like. So the initial set of quasar observations, they had convinced, you know, I think, people that these objects exist. But there is the unequivocal proving that the object that exists is a black hole. 
and is a black hole that is consistent with general relativity. And that's a different burden of proof. And so that was one of the major goals of, of astronomical research in the past sort of 40, 50 years. Now, the main place, uh, the best place this evidence came from was our very own galaxy. And so this is just, there's a bazillion pretty pictures here. There was in the preview slideshow, something was shown from pan stars. Go up north and look up. Right? When it's dark and it's not full moon, you'll see this stream of stars. That is the disk of our galaxy. Right? We live in the suburbs, way out in the outer regions. We're looking back towards the center of the galaxy. Right? The supermassive black hole that lives in the center of our galaxy lives there. Um, the sort of easy way to think about how to look for it is find the teapot and it's uh, go run out the spout. Now, okay, so first we figured out there was an object there that might be a black hole, so we started studying it. Um, how do we demonstrate that it's a black hole? And this is a movie showing uh, over 20 years of high resolution infrared observations of the environment of the galactic center of our galaxy. What you are seeing, all of these points are stars. And what you're seeing is, particularly yellow star, S2, that is tracing out a full orbit of something that we cannot see. So there is an invisible mass there, and we can figure out the mass of this star and then calculate what is the mass of this hidden mass. Now what we're also seeing now is a number of these other objects, they're a little bit farther away, and so they're doing longer orbits. And by studying these stars, what we've been able to do is really accurately determine the mass of this hidden object and determine that the only solution for it is a black hole. One of the really interesting things we could do in recent years was, you saw that in 2018, that S2 star passed near the black hole again on this elliptical orbit. Now, it passed within about 120 astronomical units of that black hole. Earth is one astronomical unit from the sun. So in terms of the solar system, that's something way out past the Oort cloud or out in that region. Um, the plot here is showing the residuals with respect to a two, two models. Well, it's re with respect to a Newtonian model. So in a Newtonian model, uh, the orbit of that star is really simple to predict. Now the data is clearly showing that the Newtonian model does not describe the orbit of that star. The red line is a general relativist relativistic fit. This perfectly agrees with the observations and allows us to determine the mass of that black hole. So what we've now unambiguously and unequivocally clearly measured is that in the center of our galaxy there exists a black hole with about four million times the mass of the sun. Um, and so in 2020 uh, a Nobel Prize was awarded partially for this research. There's three people highlighted here. Uh, Andrea Goetz, it's her group at UCLA. That movie that I just showed you with the stars, that's the labor, their labor of love. Uh, Reinhard Genzel is a, from a group in Germany. They've been doing similar work with different telescopes. So this is independent confirmation. And that's a very important part of the scientific process. And then of course Roger Penrose um, for the theoretical work that demonstrated the reality of black holes as part of the general relativistic theory. So we now have these black holes that are real um, we have the theory, we've been able to calculate things like how they might look. So the next question then is, is, would we be able to observe these black holes? Now, naively, the initial calculations, what people were doing was calculating the radius of the event horizon. And the radius of the event horizon, that's actually too small. We wouldn't be able to do that today. And so it's this part of general relativity where the curved spacetime lenses the radiation and you get this photon ring at root 27 times. 
roughly the event horizon radius. It's that boost brings the size scale up to about 50 micro arc seconds. Um, if you build a telescope, your spatial resolution is proportional to the size of the telescope. And if you build a telescope the size of the Earth, you will now have the spatial resolution to get below 50 micro arc seconds. Right? That is what the Event Horizon Telescope is. Um, this is a project to use multiple different radio telescopes distributed around the Earth to create a virtual telescope with a size approximating the disk of the Earth. And then with this facility to, to image the black holes. Now, the collaboration that was constructed to do this is, it's beautiful because it's a truly international collaboration. Uh, it's got people from all continents, all countries, and all career stages intimately involved in the construction of this instrument and the acquisition and analysis of the images. So we see here um, a plot of the disk of the Earth uh, with the, the radio facilities that were involved in the first generation of the EHT. Uh, so that is a facility in Hawaii, uh, three facilities, or two facilities in America, one in Mexico. We're going down to Chile, Antarctica, and over in Spain. So with these uh, eight facilities, you can create a, a telescope that has a virtual uh, mirror that's the size of the planet Earth. Um, this is not easy to do. We would think of the initial discovery observations as having just the amount of information that we needed to make the discovery observations. Really, we want to have more telescopes in the uh, array. And, and that's demonstrated here. So what you're doing is you're creating baselines between the different facilities. And your longest baseline is telling you the overall size of your telescope and your, spatial re your fundamental resolution limit. But all these different uh, links between them what they're doing is sampling the space at intermediate resolutions. And these, these are very important because what we do in reality then is when we're observing these black holes, um, we stare at them for a number of hours. So what you get then is sort of plots like this. And these are showing the different baselines of the telescopes in the array as the Earth rotates. And so you get these tracks. Now, if this was an optical telescope, that circle would be a mirror, and it would be full. Here we have radio observations, and this is not full. Now, this is where the difficulty comes in, uh, and it's the synthesis imaging part of the analysis. Uh, mathematically, it is possible to do this, to invert the information you get here to discover the geometry of the source you see. And you all readily understand that in that if there's an image of a complicated object, we would think of a car or a house, we put a grid on it and we start removing squares in the grid. We can remove an awful lot of those squares and you will still identify it as a car or a house. So here, we can't test structures as complicated as that. But we can test, is something a disk? Is it a ring? It is, is it a linear structure? And these are the initial tests that we need to do to identify um, the black hole. Now, the second part of the problem is um, there's a lot of plasma near the black hole. So the phenomenology of the accretion flow onto these systems is very complicated. We typically see these large-scale jets um, and this disk emission. So what we have to do then is create a model of this emission and we change the frequency. How does this model look like as we change the frequency? And what that does is it tells us that as we ramp up the frequency, and here we're going up to say just a couple of hundred gigahertz, when we do that, 
the jet emission that would normally dominate the image and the disk emission that would dominate the image and hide the black hole, that becomes um, uh, transparent. And the photons now from the photon ring and the plasma in the direct vicinity of the black hole become observable. And here this goes all the way up to um, IR wavelengths. Right, and so that's the trick that, that the Event Horizon Telescope carried out. It's to pick the right frequency to observe at and then to build the array of the requisite size. Now, I have brushed over an astonishing volume of work by people building the instrumentation, building the algorithms, doing the software, uh, uh, all of this work that is required then to skip past those details to get to the physics. So what we have here then is where we go uh, today. It's we go to a supercomputer and we simulate this flow near a black hole in very high detail. And so here what you're seeing is a, a black hole. This black hole is slightly tilted and you have a disk of emission, but you can kind of tell with your eye there's a prominent ring-like structure in there, right? This is the photon ring and then you have the disk around it. So what we have to do is take simulations like this and then we process them with our analysis pipelines. So we process them as we would see them to demonstrate our capabilities. And this is how we validate and test our observations and understand our observations are detecting the photon ring and the plasma directly near the black hole. And so you can see here two timestamps from um, one of these images. The top one is a sort of, a sort of face on um, system and the one below it is slightly tilted. And then on the, on the right we're showing um, when we convolve these with our instrument. So what you can see is there are differences between these two cases and that's what you want to be able to demonstrate. So with our instrument, with our current knowledge of the space time, we can test it with these observations. And that's of course what we did. Um, now I'm going to talk about M87 and M87, this is the black hole we first studied. And you might be thinking, huh, why, why are you doing that? Didn't they just give a Nobel Prize for studying Sagittarius A star? Isn't Sagittarius A star in our backyard? Both of those things are true. Um, but black holes are simple. And so the radius and size of the black hole, you can tell what that is from the mass, and it depends linearly on it. So it turns out that uh, Sagittarius A star is about four million times the mass of the sun. M87's black hole is about six billion times the mass of the sun. So it's about a thousand times bigger. And it turns out it's about a thousand times further away. So when we think of how big an uh, image of a black hole would be on the sky, it turns out that these two objects, M87 and Sagittarius A star, are by some distance the largest objects on the sky. Now there's another facet that helps us here. So our observational campaigns on Sagittarius A star and M87 happened in the same time period. And so the decision was made to analyze M87 first. Why? So it turns out that larger black holes, the length of time it takes for the accretion flow to vary, so for material to flow around the black hole, is actually quite long. So it's uh, in day timescales. So that means when we observe it on any given night, it's in a certain configuration and it's relatively stable. When we come back the next night, it'll be different, but only a little bit different. Sagittarius A star, as it's much smaller, that time to vary is only tens of minutes. So during our observations, Sagittarius A star varies like crazy. Um, so we understood then that that analysis would be much more complicated. And so the decision was made to look at M87 first. Uh, M87 is, is shown here, the galaxy. Um, this is an optical light from Hubble and one of the uh, astounding things about this galaxy is that even in optical light, you can immediately see the radio jet. That's relatively rare. Uh, 
And that radio jet, all the way out to where the stars almost end, that's powered by the black hole right in the center of that galaxy. And that black hole has got a radius that's on solar system scales. So somehow that, that's the power of these black holes. They're solar system scales, and they're ejecting plasma way out of the galaxy. This system has been interesting for a long, long time because of this jet. One of the big questions in astrophysics is how are these jets powered? Um, they're associated with black holes, the most powerful jets. And so it's in some sense a tapping of the energy of the curved space-time near that black hole. How does that work? And here you see images happening over many years with different facilities and, and size scales. Well, on the top, we're at about 3,000 light years. Right? The nearest star to the sun is four light years away. Sagittarius A star is about 24,000 light years away. So this image here is on about the scale of uh, from us to the black hole in the center of our galaxy. So as we zoom in there, we're at three light years down the bottom. So that's the sun and the nearest star. That's the scale we're seeing, that jet. And we keep zooming in. Now we're at 0.3 light years. And then we're zooming in to where we get to the Event Horizon Telescope. And really, what we want to do from a science perspective is two things. We're studying the space-time, studying the black hole, but then we're also studying the astrophysics of how this jet is powered, and by zooming in on it on different scales, you're seeing how the mass moves through that jet, and you can see the power in it and connect it back to the black hole. Um, so I showed you a simulation before, and really that is the name of the game. So the analysis of these images is quite complicated. The procedure undertaken was very rigorous. So a number of teams were created, and these teams had different codes, and they all operated completely independently. So they produced images that were all remarkably similar. So that demonstrates that the data really does have this ring-like structure in it. That ring-like structure has the right size that says it's the photon ring from uh, a black hole of a number of billion solar masses. So what we did then is you create all these uh, GRMHD simulations. So these are all done on big computing clusters. Many of these are created. And we start comparing and contrasting some of these images to uh, the data. And so, for example, you can see some of these have more symmetric uh, emission profiles, say like on the bottom corner here, whereas you go to the opposite bottom corner and it's strongly just on one side. And we compare this then to our data to um, validate our analysis. So the resulting image um, is here. It's uh, very famous. I'm sure you're all familiar with it by now. Uh, there's quite a bit of, of physics in this. So the black hole itself is about 6.5 uh, by 10 to the 9 solar masses. Because we measured the ring, the ring is a product of the curved space-time produced by the mass of the black hole. So measuring the ring gives you a mass estimate. Um, this black hole is about 55 million light years from Earth. This flow is rotating in a clockwise direction. So the brightening enhancement at the bottom region, that's this Doppler boosting due to the vast velocities of that material. Now there's a jet from this system. We're uh, resolving right down close to the black hole. The jet, uh, if we were to think of it in this image, it would be coming out in, say, the 4 o'clock direction, so sort of down this way, and out into the screen, so at about 20 or 30 degrees. So that's in this analysis to some degree. So the uh, emission we're seeing here is some of the photon ring some of the plasma that's orbiting around the black hole in a disk, and then some, perhaps, of that jet. And that's really the type of thing we're, we're trying to figure out now. Um, this was an incredibly gratifying process for, for us. And, and one of the things that um, we saw was the uh, breadth of coverage of this discovery. 
And due to the international collaboration, all right, we have funding agencies from all of these countries contributing. So here in America, the NSF supported this procedure. Right? In Europe, you have the European Research Council in the different countries in Europe, in Asia. So you have those research bodies are, in a sense, the representatives of the people in that country. And so all of these media organizations picked it up, and, and this image was just plastered um, everywhere. And, and really, that uh, communication of our hard work to the public was a really rewarding thing to see. Um, now, one of the things that um, I was involved with then was the um, uh, observational support campaign. And so what you're seeing here is uh, a vast campaign that was taken with many, many facilities on the ground and with satellites in space to capture all of the radiation coming from that accretion flow. So at the same time that humanity, for the first time, was able to see the black hole itself and the plasma right there beside it, we were also measuring the emission from all of that accretion flow. And we created this uh, beautiful legacy data set that will have astonishing value for years to come. So what you're seeing here on the left is moving from the ring uh, on, at the bottom all the way up to radio frequencies, seeing at larger and larger scales. In the center here at the bottom, you're seeing HST and the optical. Uh, that was the image I showed you basically in the beginning. Uh, Swift, an X, a UV satellite. Uh, Swift and X-ray. And then we have, on the top right, we have Chandra, the premier X-ray facility, uh, New Star, and then various gamma ray facilities. Now, the thing you'll notice is that it's only really at radio that we're observing right beside the black hole. So elsewhere, we're, we don't have the spatial resolution, and so what we're doing is we're collecting all of the radiation from in there. And that is the challenge now that um, is set to the astronomical community. It's we have this vast data set, and how do we turn that into constraints on how the space time, the curved space time around this black hole, is powering these jets and powering the emission we see. And this is an incredible data set. So you're, the, the plot here is in frequency and the bottom axis, and it's going from 10 to the 9 gigahertz. And the final tick up here is about 10 to the 27. Right, so that's 18 orders of magnitude in frequency going from radio all the way up to gamma rays. And this is the emission that was coming from that black hole at the time that we observed it as a species for the first time. Now, our initial analysis of this data sort of says that we don't really know how to analyze all of this just yet. That's great. That's telling us that we have required new constraints. We have to figure them out, though. One of the initial things that we could see, though, was that this high energy emission from the gamma rays at the time of our observation was probably not being produced by the plasma near the black hole. We're pretty certain of that. Now, this is really interesting because we've been observing this system again in 2018, and there was another campaign in 2021, or, or it happened this year. Um, and there was a variation in the gamma ray flux. And so now what we have is a change in conditions, and this data set will allow us to really test and understand what's happening. Uh, the other thing we were able to do was look at the polarization of that light. The polarization of the emission is telling us something about the magnetic field that's in that plasma. Uh, the Swirls here are showing you sort of the trajectory of the polarization measurements. And what they're telling us is that this plasma is actually highly magnetized. And the magnetization is such that it's consistent with models we have for these magnetically arrested accretion flows. So that is where the plasma, as it comes in from large radii, brings magnetic fields with it. And the magnetic fields pile up in the inner regions and they can restrict and interact with the accretion flow. And this observation is consistent with that, but there's much more work um, to happen here. So that's the great science that we were able to get out of um, M87, and, and that data set will be used for years to come. Um, so now we turn to the case of Sagittarius A star. 
So this is a, a radio image um, focusing on the inner region of our galaxy. Uh, so you're seeing many, many interesting things down here on the bottom right. This sort of circular structure, that's a supernova remnant, so a star that exploded. Uh, these structures here, sort of in this linear structure, uh, are massive star forming regions. And then right in the center, this bright knot, that is where Sagittarius A star lives. And this is uh, data that was released by the Meerkat telescope only this year. And the structure here is phenomenal. A uh, big question people would ask is, how do you get plasma into thin filaments like that? And that's research that people are really aggressively um, tracking down right now. So um, like I said earlier on, Sagittarius A star is highly variable. Now we also had learned many lessons from the M87 analysis. And so we could more efficiently produce large suites of simulations. And so this is just a sample of the hundreds and hundreds of simulations that were produced to try and understand the signals we were seeing from Sagittarius A star that were highly variable. So what you're seeing here are various timestamps in different simulations. And as the accretion flow varies um, turbulently around the black hole, you see different things. And so our question is then is how much of the variability we see is due to variations of that manner. Uh, so the choice that was made in the end was to do an averaging process. So many, many observations uh, of Sagittarius A star were possible, uh, but these were all different as they were varying. And so a clustering analysis was constructed. So there's a little histogram here in these bottom insets. So what that histogram is showing you is uh, the average structure of the ring across our broad sample of observations. And it's got this uh, sort of falling off uh, partial histogram form. And so the decision was made then is that there's four broad um, styles of variability that we're seeing. And that's what the insets here are showing you as we move um, across uh, the image. So averaging all of this then, that gives us the resulting image. Um, this is less constraining than our image of M87. So the size is uh, what we would predict. We know the mass and the size is exactly on point. So again, it's consistent with the um, predictions of general relativity. We're not really able to tell in which direction this is rotating. And so one of the problems with Sagittarius A star is that it's about a thousand times fainter than M87 and it doesn't have a really obvious radio jet. So that's one of the things we're hoping to do um, in coming years, is try to um, improve uh, the quality of this data set and see if we can pull out the direction of rotation of uh, this emission. There's, there's real interest and excitement in that result because some of the IR observations that I talked about earlier on have, in recent years, detected uh, point-like emission structures that are apparently orbiting in clockwise directions around the black hole from regions that are very near the black hole. And recently, some radio observations saw a similar phenomenology. So what we would like to be able to show in a direct imaging sense is can we directly image that flow and confirm that what they are seeing is indeed rotation of plasma right beside the black hole. Um, so similarly, we got a, a spectrum and a vast data set of, of our AGN. Um, the prominent black circles here are the observations we obtained during our EHT campaign. The other data points are historical measurements. What you can see is that Sagittarius A star is a really faint black hole. It's not accreting much mass, but it does occasionally have meals. And so you can see in x-rays, it flares from time to time, and that's what this large uh, shaded region is showing you about how bright it can get from time to time. We were um, really unlucky in that there was an x-ray flare during um, 
an, an observation, but it just wasn't at a time when the EHT was covering it. It was just right after. And so the plus side of that, I suppose, is that we know that the flaring structures that happen around this accretion flow do happen um, during the times that we're observing it. And so it's a matter of in coming years now, as, as our techniques improve, really we should be able to see one of those events, and that will be very exciting. Um, so that's the two black holes that we've been able to observe, the 6.5 billion solar mass M87 and the 4 million solar mass Sagittarius A star. So this is showing it on the scale of the solar system, right? So you're looking at the photon ring of Sagittarius A star being just inside the orbit of Mercury, right? The event horizon is smaller again, remember. And then M87 is a behemoth that's extending way out to where, say, Voyager is. And that's one of the coolest things we've done as a species too. All that time ago, launching that spacecraft, and they're actually exiting the solar system now and entering interstellar space. Um, so one of the things we want to do is understand gravity, and these observations of black holes allow us to do that. We're not really at a place to put strong constraints on GR just yet with the EHT observations. One of the questions we can ask, though, is, is gravity the same depending on all of the, the mass? So if you have a five solar mass black hole, does gravity act the same as a million solar mass black hole as a billion solar mass black hole? And so these are the constraints we get from looking at M87, Sagittarius A star, and then a consideration of some LIGO gravitational wave events by um, Saltus um, last year. Uh, and this is with data demonstrating that GR is scale invariant, right? The theory says it should. There's no reason why it shouldn't be, but we now actually have observations that show that. All right, so I'll just end now with um, a brief kind of discussion of, so we have these initial observations where do we go from here? So the basic idea is something that uh, you, know, you all appreciate from what I've said, is that we need to increase the number of telescopes. And so that will get us from the inset here for M87. You can see the red and blue data points are sort of where we are right now. And if we add more telescopes, you see we fill that in. We fill that in, we have a more complete virtual telescope. We get more information out. The kind of things we can get out, you can see in these two panels, the bottom is for Sagittarius A star. For M87, with the simulation of the emission near the black hole, the jet, we can actually see that coming out. If we complete this next gen array, we can actually see that in data. So we can connect the plasma near the black hole to the initial stages of that jet. And that's a really, really exciting prospect. On the bottom here, you're thinking about Sagittarius A star. And here with Sagittarius A star, it's can we make our observations of a shorter and shorter duration to capture the source as it's varying and get enough signal to, to see that uh, photon ring? And that's indeed what we think we'll be able to do. Um, so this, is, this next gen EHT project is going to take a number of years. Uh, it's, it's ramping up over time. Uh, one of the things we hope to be able to do is go to test GR in the strong field limit. So the result that we see, right, is a supposition of the flow, the accretion flow, and this photon ring. Now the photon ring is a unique property of the space-time produced by the black hole. And if the black hole is rotating, Faster or slower, the precise shape and position of the photon ring changes. And we hope to be able to do this sort of test where you can break the emission up into the accretion flow emission and the photon ring itself and study in detail its structure to study GR. And that's one of the things that, that we're really excited about doing. Um, in a more... Um, kind of uh, visually appealing sense, right? There's tons of science in here, but we 
uh, think we'll be able to capture movies of these varying accretion flows. And so you're seeing here, just like we see in the simulations, right, this turbulent flow from plasma right beside a black hole as it varies directly as a function of time. And this will provide incredibly powerful constraints on the space-time and the plasma physics uh, in operation in that region of space. So that's something that will happen um, as we move out towards 2030. Uh, on longer time scales, we're going to have to go to space. And so this is the part of the talk where um, young people who are in the audience here and who are watching, your ears should be picking up. Because this part of the project is going to take decades to do. This is the kind of thing that you can start thinking about doing when you go to college, and you can be the person that leads important parts of that project in the decades to come. Um, the graphic is a kind of a nice cartoon. Um, the plot on the left is actual data. And so this is showing us, right, the two black holes we've done, they are by some distance the biggest black holes on the sky. To get to any of the other known black holes in the nearby universe, um, we really need to go to space. That's the only way we're going to do that. Because we need to get down to resolutions of close to one micro arc second. And we're kind of limited in the region of about 30-ish um, on the ground. But this is a, an exciting prospect to go from uh, you know, potentially uh, in a couple of hundred years, um, you know, these wacky things to having them being real to in a couple of decades' time having a statistical sample of these objects and be able to study the characteristics of uh, them and, and the different personalities of black holes that are created and will really allow us to constrain uh, space time and, and general relativity. Okay, so. Um, I will end there and, and leave these uh, two images. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. That was uh, amazing, fascinating, and congratulations on, uh, on the fruits of your efforts so far. And also thanks so much for laying out uh, the future uh, for the young astronomers in the audience here uh, and elsewhere. That's, that's very exciting. We have uh, a lot of questions, actually, and they are still coming in. Um, there were questions about general relativity from the beginning of your talk, questions about uh, the instrument itself or the event horizon telescope, if instrument is the right term. Uh, and uh, many questions about black holes, and of course questions about your image. So let me, let me try to get started here. So um, one question, which I think there was a bit of an answer later on, which is what is actually the best laboratory for the testing general relativity? Is it black holes? Is it more precise measurements of the other uh, predictions? Um, uh I think the key tests of GR and the strong field limit are going to come from black holes. Um, there's two avenues to this. There is the uh, observations like the EHT, where we're seeing plasma near the black hole. One of the big predictions from general relativity is that for Kerr black holes, so these black holes that are rotating near the maximum limit, they couple the space-time near them and they force that space-time to rotate. So potentially, you know, when we get our observations to high enough fidelity, uh, particularly with polarization, you can imagine the polarization is tracking the plasma, and as the space-time warps, the polarization can flip. That's a very, um, it's a weak signal. It will take a lot of work to get there, but we could potentially directly test that and observe it. And that will be, uh, I think, really well complemented by gravitational wave observations. And what they're doing is, is seeing, um, at, at higher signal-to-noises, they're going to be able to probe 
GR um, two error terms in GR, and, and they're not really there yet. And so it's really, I think, a combination of those two sort of ideas in, in the electromagnetic realm and the gravitational wave realm coupled together will, will probably be the best way to do strong field GR. I see, thank you. Um, there's some more basic theory questions. Um, one of them is, is, is there a bias against the notion of a singularity that's sort of just um, intellectual bias or a theoretical bias, or is this actually now accepted? Um, I think what we understand is when we observe the universe, um, things like the standard model and GR do not describe everything we see. And we have things like dark matter and dark energy. For example, and if they're real, they're telling us that our theory is incomplete. I think the widest, um, accepted uh, interpretation of the singularity in a black hole would be that that is some issue with GR as currently calculated. And what we know is that with baryonic matter, um, we describe that with quantum mechanics. And it's not understood how to describe gravita gravitational uh, events with quantum mechanics. The most obvious solution to the singularity is that if you merge GR and quantum mechanics correctly, that the singularity will sort of be fixed and that sort of feature will become something else that's more real. Uh, but again, it's not clear. Uh, we remain to be surprised, I think, and I wouldn't be surprised if we were, um, what would be how I would think of that. You know, there's another question more directly about quantum mechanics, which I think you addressed, but I did want to acknowledge uh, that question about how quantum mechanics might modify or affect the singularity. So I, I think you. Yeah, I think that's. <laughs> That's where PhDs and PhDs are being invested in Yet trying to, to understand how to do that. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, let's go to uh, some questions about your telescope. And one question is, could you explain the term virtual telescope? Well, what we mean virtual is that um, we're synthesizing an array that's the size of the disk of the planet Earth. And that doesn't exist. So mathematically, what we can do is with enough observations covering the points in that virtual disk, you can create uh, the ability to observe structures with such a telescope. So it's in that sense that it's virtual. Um, the telescopes are real and the techniques we're doing are real, but uh, an actual telescope like that is virtual. Um. Okay. Um, so you actually, um, here's another question is, do you actually need to use uh, for a set of observations all of the real telescopes <laughs> in your array? Uh, well, so or as the Earth rotates, you know, some could... This could... is um, some of the details I didn't speak about. So you can think of having telescopes in, say, Greenland, in Spain, in Chile, in America, in Antarctica. So at a certain night of the year, they all have to be able to observe a similar place in the sky. So the weather, of course, varies in all of these places. Um, car accidents, power outages, someone tripping over something, stuff happens. And so um, you could actually see in the two Sagittarius A-star tracks for different nights that in the second night, it had more than the previous night, for example. And so these things do happen. Your ability to tolerate absences of facilities is limited. If there's a certain number missing, you fundamentally can't do the, the experiment. But maybe one missing, we can still get by. So a couple more questions related to that. So your observations, uh, you mentioned day and night. Was that actual the day and night for the sun or the day and night for the telescope looking at the black hole? Um, I think, uh, let me see, day and night. Um, I'm not exactly sure where you're referencing, but um, typically we will be observing in, in night. Um, it's, it's, it's where 
uh, the atmosphere is more stable in most I places. I see. So there's a technical reason for that. So it really is not. Well, uh, yeah, you're, you're not in the strictest sense limited, but it's when is the atmosphere the most stable and right. when is the sun not pushing around things and things like that. Uh, but radio waves are rather different than optical um, distortions. Yeah, radio waves, but we're, uh, remember, we're up in the submillimeter, and so you're much more sensitive to water vapor and things like that there. So. Absorption. Um, how long does it take uh, to make, I mean, how long, you know, how many hours or days or weeks? The data was uh, taken in 2017 in say the March, April time period. And, and that's the time period when all of these telescopes um, can be scheduled to observe these two targets. Uh, so the data rates are incredibly high. So you're creating at each telescope petabytes of data. So the data has to be put on hard drives, packed in a box and shipped. One of the telescopes is in Antarctica. Right, so that takes an amount of time. Then these, uh, this data has to be taken to large supercomputers to do the correlations between the different telescopes. What you're essentially trying to do is the wave front that arrives at your telescope in Arizona is from the source. You see the wave front also hit the telescope in Antarctica. It will be at a slightly different time. You have to figure out what the, the corrections and correlate all these signals. That takes a supercomputer to do. That's an awful lot of number crunching. Uh, and then you have to uh, put your algorithms to process what comes out. You have to bench test and uh, validate all these things. This was happening for the first time. So that process took a number of years, right? The M87 result came out in 2021. And it really was, you know, I suppose COVID intervened, slowed that process down a little, but it took years. And that was vast teams of people um, doing this because it was really a pioneering experiment. And so to understand what we're measuring and how we're measuring it correctly, just took a slow methodical process. So like much of science, acquiring the data is short compared to the analysis, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, but like much of science, the um, getting to the position where you can take data uh, okay. probably takes two times as long as it does to analyze it. Taking the data takes a little bit of time. Um, and so it's, that's a process too. Say the first ideas about the EHT would have happened in the late 90s and various test experiments were carried out through the early 2000s, and you got to the place where we could demonstrate we could do it by sort of 2010-ish. And so from there to sort of 2017 was really just putting the same equipment everywhere, because you need atomic clock level precision at each instrument to do the correlations. So there's a lot of just hardware had to be built and installed and tested and all these things too. This was another question, actually, how good the timing has to be and, and how you accomplish that yeah, to so coordinate it's, these. It's the atomic clocks at each site. Um, it's, it's critically important that you know when your wave front arrives at each telescope and that you can timestamp that and link it all up afterwards. And another question that uh, we had a few like this that related to um, the computing power needed uh, for the simulations and apparently also for the analysis. Um, you're, you're needing large clustered computing environments. Uh, say with um, Sagittarius A-star now, we sort of know how to do the basics of these large simulations, so you can take some shortcuts uh, and maybe do some of the simulation and not all of it, because you have good initial conditions and things like that. But um, you could think of the largest supercomputers that are uh, supported by the NSF and available to researchers in America and some of those facilities are used to carry out these simulations um, near the black hole. And particularly, you know, um, right near the black hole, you have the black hole of, say, a certain size scale, but you're looking to resolve plasma instabilities that are 10 or 100 times smaller than the black hole, and then you have general relativity, and you want to understand how radiation is there too. And so putting radiation and GR and resolution, all these things, it's uh, very, very expensive to do. Um, about this image, actually, that you're showing us, so um, just a little more explanation to interpret it. Where is the event horizon, actually? Um, the event horizon is in the center somewhere there. So one of the things that we can't constrain from these images yet is what is the spin of the black hole? Now, if that black hole is not spinning, 
right? The event horizon should be at the center. Now, if the black hole is rotating, the entire image will have a shift to some degree. Um, and then we're also observing it at an inclination. So uh, M87 is at about 30 degrees. The Sagittarius A star is a little bit uncertain. It seems to be almost face on. Um, and so that, uh, those wrinkles are there and, and they're not understood enough yet to be able to firmly say exactly where the location of the event horizon is. And uh, you can kind of see, um, if I go back here um, to, Um, so this plot, say, um, so you see for the um, rapidly rotating black hole case, the event horizon is not at the center of the photon ring anymore here in these two plots on the right. And so it's that type of effect. So you need to know the spin of the black hole to uh, with confidence say where the black hole is. And, and that's something that with the NGEHT, we think we'll be able to do. From the shape of the photon ring or... Uh, yeah. Very good. So there's some, I guess, astronomy questions um, about the distributions of black holes. Um, so a couple of things. One is, is there a pattern to the location of black holes in space? Um, there's a pattern in the sense that every galaxy that is as big as the Milky Way or bigger, we're very confident that they all have supermassive black holes in their center. Smaller galaxies, it's more of a question. A lot of them also have supermassive black holes at the center of the galaxy. So it's some part of the process of forming galaxies is that you form black, massive black holes, and the massive black hole lies at the bottom of the potential well of the galaxy at the same time. Um, that's not really understood. Now, at the same time, we think of our galaxy as a disk, um, we know of about 20 so or so-ish black holes that we're sort of gold standard sure of. There's about another 40 or 50 systems that we sort of have smoking gun evidence. We expect there's of order 100 million black holes in our galaxy. Um, and they should be distributed in some sense randomly, but they should follow the stars. So in, in that sense, the, the patterns are where the mass is, the black holes are following the mass or the mass is following the black holes. It's not clear. In your, towards the end of your talk, when you were uh, talking about the future, you had a graph with a lot of known black holes on it. And the question is how we know where those black holes are. How, how are they observed? Um, we would uh, say we can observe, say something like M87, and we see its phenomenology. And a lot of these other galaxies exhibit very, very similar phenomenology. So some of these galaxies in this kind of um, teal region here, we can't resolve the black hole, but we can resolve the jet way down close to near the black hole. And it behaves incredibly similarly. So it's all of these systems, they sort of walk and talk like our black hole. We have dynamical measurements of the stars in these galaxies. It's a... Uh, less strong constraint than you get from the stars around Sagittarius A star. That also says it's a black hole. We can do things like study masers. These are radio sort of lasers that tend to form in some disk galaxies. They orbit, and again, they can allow you to measure the gravitational mass. And we can, there's a number of other methods, and they would all kind of say that there's black holes in many of these other galaxies. And we have good mass constraints for some of them, um, and, and not so good for some of the others. And say the uh, bright blue ones here are, say, radio galaxies. They all have jets. And the lighter blue ones don't have as prominent jets. But some of those, we know they have black holes, too. OK, that's very interesting. Um, so the black hole merger that led to the gravity wave observations um, in the last decade, are, where would that go on this, appear in this plot? This is my own question, um, So, by the so way. That, that, that black hole is sort of two 30 solar mass objects, and so it's order 60 solar masses. All of these things are a, billion to, right. a, a million to a billion solar masses. So 
And it's, it's one of the things that we think that how, you, how do you get a billion solar mass black hole? Maybe in the very early universe, you start merging lots of smaller black holes and then they do some eating and things like that. But uh, so in that sense, the, there's no, it's not that they're not related, but right now the obvious link between those two things other than we're studying gravity near a black hole is not, maybe the direct link is not there. Um, here's a question about the black holes at the centers of galaxies, um, the largest ones, I guess, uh, which is how did the size of the mass of the black hole relate to the size or mass of the galaxy? Um, this is, again, really, really interesting. So we don't need to understand how things work to study things, and we can study um, methods for estimating the mass of the black hole, and we can plot that versus the mass of the stars. And that how they're correlated. So for some reason, in the universe, when galaxies form, the size of the black hole they form is dependent upon the amount of stars in the galaxy. Or the amount of stars in the galaxy is dependent on the size of the black hole you formed. So which way that goes and exactly how they're related is not clear. It's an observational and empirical reality in the universe. And so that's, that's one of the big things we're trying to understand is, is how that process, and how, the, how, how that correlation was generated by you know, the universe and physics doing its thing. And earlier on, you mentioned dark energy and dark matter. So there was a question about how those actually interact with black holes. Um, well, we would think dar dark matter is, as we think of it, is non-electromagnetic matter. So it behaves and responds to general relativity, and it gravitates. So a black hole. Uh, typically, the black holes in big galaxies are at the center of these potential wells. The potential well is not actually generated by the stars, it's actually generated by the dark matter. So the dark matter is the scaffolding for the universe. The stars and the galaxies form where the scaffolding of the dark matter says, and the black hole lies there. So the black holes do know about the gravitational influence of dark matter, or at least that's what it would appear to say. Generally, dark matter, as we would think of it, is um, more diffuse, and so smaller black holes, it's not like they will become into a binary orbit with a lump of dark matter. They can potentially accrete dark matter. Um, how that process works, though, is very dependent on what you think dark matter is. Or, in fact, lens it, right? And it could lens it, too, right? Whatever that would look like. <laughs> <laughs> how you observe that, yes. Um, is there a theoretical mass limit to a black hole? We're now getting into the questions that are very specific. There's an observed mass limit in that we don't see black holes above about 10 billion solar masses. Um, it's not clear that there is a physics reason for that, but there is a, an amount of mass required to do that comes from somewhere, and so whatever galaxy that black hole is in, it's using up some of the mass in that galaxy, and after a certain period of time, uh, there's a sort of an equilibrium established where much more mass can't really flow in. What does is such a small fraction of the now mass of the black hole that any remaining growth is so, so slow. Um, it's, it's these types of things I think are coupling. Um, so it's an empirical observed limit rather than physics. So black holes are providing energy to their surroundings. That's what you observe. Um, will, black, will a black hole ever burn out? Um, let me see. So you could think of it as burning out in two ways. One is, is a black hole uh, accreting matter? And when it accretes matter, that matter heats up and releases tremendous amounts of energy. And the black hole can release these jets. It can accelerate this matter. So when it uses up that mass, the black hole is just sitting there doing nothing afterwards. That's one way. Another idea is that black holes can actually evaporate over time, very, very slowly. And if we would think of black holes that formed in a very, very early universe, sort of black holes up to the size of a large asteroid would have evaporated in the time that the universe is, uh, has taken up to now. 
So bigger black holes would still be here. That's teeny tiny. It's an astonishingly slow process. So in black holes like Sagittarius A star and M87, that process is completely irrelevant. So burning out is kind of a, I don't know, it's an interesting way to think about it, I guess, but um, depends how you interpret it. Um, so there are a couple of questions um, and comments um, that deal with what happens inside the event horizon. Um, so let me uh, go through some of we these. We went into a library and um, we were observing people in secret. So that's one idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so what, actually, what is the, um, the density? It's greater than nuclear density. Um, or is it? Well, so how do you calculate the density? So do you use the whole volume? Or how concentrated is it? And so that, that's part of the question. Um, what the singularity is, is another part of the question. So with a non-rotating Schwarzschild black hole, the singularity is at the center and it's a point. With a rapidly rotating black hole, the singularity is actually a ring. A ring. And it has structure. Um, now, they're the sort of vanilla GR physics that people accept if there's a paradigm. When we want to test GR in the strong field limit, what you're doing is saying, we had Newtonian gravity, we have GR, and at some place do we need a new theory. People produce these new theories with slight differences. They produce different black holes with different morphologies for the singularity. So um, that depends. You can calculate it almost any way you want, depending on the theory you select. So uh, there was a question about the size of the singularity, and that depends on the spin. All black holes do spin, though. Um, I would find it hard to conceive of a way in which you could get an astronomical body to not be rotating. That just, that's in space, the, all of the possibilities, that's a pinhead. How do you stay stable on that pinhead versus all of the other options you have? So there's no reason to be there. Now, could a black hole be not rotating for some small period in time? If a black hole is rotating in this direction and it accretes gas that's going in this direction, these angular momenta are opposite to each other. The black hole will slow down. And yeah, perhaps the black hole will, for a period of time, be static on its way to rotating in the other direction. Um, but it's a very useful calculation because it's the least complicated calculation. And so in that sense, as we, if you want to learn about general relativity, the place you should start at is with a Schwarzschild static non-rotating black hole. Because if you go straight to the rotating case, there's all these extra complications that are there from the beginning, and it's an awful lot of things to get lost in. And so in that sense, it's a very useful theoretical tool. So just to press a little more, though, on what it's like inside the event horizon. Um, so the density is kind of undefined, um, as, as you mentioned. The mass is distributed the mass, the mass is distributed in the singularity, would be how people would think of it. Uh, the gravitational potentials that we're seeing in GR would agree with that type of picture. It's not that we measure that that's the way it is, but our data is consistent with that. Now, we don't necessarily have the signal to noise to be really able to say things are a little different yet. Um, Inside the event horizon is kind of interesting in the sense that the tidal forces you experience near the event horizon depend on the mass of the black hole. Because as the black holes get bigger, the actual tidal forces decrease. So the way cur space is curved, it's most curved around smaller black holes. So stellar mass black holes in our galaxy actually have the strongest curvature of space time around them. These supermassive black holes have much less. So say Sagittarius A star, a star like the sun, if it got near that, it would get torn apart. If Sagittarius, if the sun went near M87, it could actually just wander across the event horizon and not get torn apart. And probably for the most massive black holes, um, you could uh, get in a Tesla Roadster and sort of just fly across the event horizon and 
the forces, you know, you'd feel tidal forces that are different, but it's not, they're not going to kill anything. But it's the same thing. That event horizon is a no return point. So you might be inside and you can whistle and you can do whatever you want. Nobody will know about it anymore. Um, and, and we're not at a place where we can really theoretically describe what happens there yet. We can speculate with different theories. And sort of with that sort of idea set, it's a very interesting thing to conceive that with these most massive black holes, you could potentially go inside it. Uh, and, and, you know, versus the extreme environments we classically think of with the smaller black holes where things are spaghettified and destroyed and, and all of these. But remember, that spaghettification and destruction is, a lot of it is the thing that we see at our vantage point. The person down there is, you know, and, and Interstellar did this really well when they were on the planet. Their clocks were ticking normally, they're walking around normally. All of these things are happening normally, right? But when they go back to the spaceship, 20 years has passed. They were down there for a day. And so there's, there's reference frame things that, that occur. And so what we see at a great distance can be different to what the person is perceiving at the event horizon. Um, and it's knowing GR allows you to convert what you see into what's happening. Uh, OK, one last question, which is, how do the magnetic fields arise? So black holes spin, but there must be um, some charge. So we, we would think of black holes uh, as being charge neutral in that uh, any charge that accumulates on a black hole should rapidly dissipate. Um, now, the, so the magnetic field is not intrinsic to the black hole. It's been brought with the gas and the plasma. And you think of the sun has a magnetic field. Um, the solar wind, there's magnetic field with that plasma. Interstellar space, the mass there, has a very weak magnetic field. And so over time, you're bringing it in from large radii, and you're bringing it to a smaller radius. So something that's diffuse out here over time can build up. Say with M87, we're getting to fields of about somewhere around a Gauss to 30 Gauss. It's not you know, very, very strong in sort of the kind of things we can do in terrestrial laboratories. But that's enough to affect the plasma uh, in that environment in a way that's observable. And we think it's actually very important in how these flows work. And, and then powering these jets, so with these uh, Kerr black holes and this ergo region, you can actually have the magnetic fields partially in this ergo region uh, treading it. And then what they are doing is they are forced to rotate with the black hole, but they're coupled to the region outside. And they can essentially extract energy, angular momenta from the black hole. And there's good reasons to think that that's one of the mechanisms by which these jets are powered. Um, and, and that's one of the things we want to observationally demonstrate and test. That's great. Well, I think that covers the um, questions that we've gotten, and thanks for answering them and responding so masterfully. And thank you very much for the questions, and Mark, uh, Dr. Mark Reynolds, thanks so much for this great lecture and for the discussion. You're very welcome, and thank you all.